Placentia Bay is on the southern coast of Newfoundland and it used to be teeming with life. Marine mammals such as the humpback whales are seals, but you also get uh, invertebrates and fish that are economically valuable as well. It used to be where most lobster will be fished out of Newfoundland will be in Placentia Bay in the 80s. Uh, it used to be also a very important fishery place for Atlantic cod, but we know that cod and lobster fishery have pretty much disappeared from Placentia Bay. Eelgrass is actually really beneficial uh, to both animal life and human life. In Canada, eelgrass is actually deemed an ecologically significant species because the loss of eelgrass would actually result in impacts to other species. They provide numerous ecosystem services, so benefits to people and species, so cultural, ecological and economical benefits. Unfortunately, as beneficial as this ecosystem is, it's not always treated as such. And one aspect of that could be caused by pollution, but it could be also caused by invasive species that come from ballast water from the maritime traffic that, uh, that goes through Placentia Bay every year. So in 2006, 2007, we saw an increase in the European green crab population and a decline in eelgrass in Placentia Bay. The European green crab is one of the 10 most unwanted invasive species in the world. What they do is they come into these habitats and they tear up eelgrass and they eat the juvenile species and they, they just flatten it. Without restoration intervention, we risk losing these ecosystems that are ecologically, culturally, and economically valuable. We risk having sediment barrens rather than the structurally complex system that is so valuable to so many species and people. So the project started, the first step was really to, to build a team. We built a team here at the Marine Institute, but we also um, started to reach out to lots of potential collaborators interested in, in that project. Once the team was built, you know, we had to create you know, the different objective and the different milestone that we'll, we'll get through the project for every year. Uh, restoration projects kind of come twofold. Um, there's a lot of efforts that have to be put into restoring the habitat itself uh, and then monitoring it to see if it's actually been working. The main two restoration techniques are both active and passive. So active would be actively going into the ecosystem and uh, transplanting and re-establishing the habitat. Whereas passive would be uh, the removal of the stressor. So for our, in our case, that'd be the removal of the European green crab. And then once this is done, we hope that the ecosystem will naturally start to, to balance itself and fish will come back into this habitat and, and then try to live there again. The logistic behind uh, trapping green crab is first we had to select a fishing gear that will be efficient. Uh, previous research has shown that um, there is traps from Japan that are called Fukui traps and those are very effective at fishing green crab. Then we had to select the bait and we found that green crab were very, very much attracted by, by the leftovers of cod, basically. We then did research in the scientific literature to identify the different strategies people have used to restore eelgrass. Planting eelgrass, that was one of the most uh, challenging parts of the project. So we first identified very healthy bed, and then this what we call the donor bed, and then we collected seeds from those beds, and that we dispersed in place where we wanted to restore. So it'd be either transplanting uh, just the shoots, uh, just seeds, or the sods themselves. We call it underwater gardening. So we go out and we, we the shovels and we dig up these massive sods and we store them in Tupperware containers, lug them all to our uh, transplant site, the area we're trying to restore, and then we plant them. So you plant the grass in, in the summer and now in the fall, and then you have the winter and you cannot go in the water anymore. <laughs> you don't know what is happening in the winter. And then you go then in the spring, a bit later in the spring, it's the first time you've been there since you planted and you're very nervous because you're like, oh, did it survive? You know, it's, it's still underwater or did, I don't know, it washed away with a current or did it washed away with I don't know, the ice? Did the ice took everything away? And it really makes you hope that you can help restore all the ecological, economic and cultural benefits and all your effort is actually going to work in helping bring these benefits back. The first year we planted, our technique wasn't good enough and we came back and we saw everything washed ashore. And that was ah, that was very heartbreaking, you know, we put in lots of effort and everything washed, washed ashore and it, yeah, it felt sad. It, the shoots might have washed away because it was a very wavy area. So next year, uh, when we go back to restore the area, we would use sods because they're more stable and we can bury them further. But then, we, of course, we adapted the technique and then after the years, I remember one first year I went swimming, it was in May, 
It was the first time I went to that site after we put in lots of effort in the previous year to restore and, and I saw everything alive, you know, at the exact location where we planted everything was still alive. It was not expanded yet, but the fact that it has survived already through the winter was very exciting. We are only starting to see a result uh, of, of this project because, of course, lots of restoration takes many years to do, but also many years after that to really see the impact of it. We are hoping to continue the monitoring as part of graduate student work and research in the next couple of years. Starting as just a research assistant in my undergrad, it gave me a lot of uh, opportunities to see the ecosystem rebound uh, and see kind of what I was working toward in my career. You get to see um, these promising signs of restoration. Two of our sites actually have significantly more eelgrass uh, than they did back in 2017 when the project started. We're seeing some smaller green crab, which is also a very good sign. The lobster fishery has been done for almost 20 to 30 years now. Through that project, we have also monitored baby lobster density in different locations in Placentia Bay, and we have seen a, a significant growth in the number of baby lobsters in the last recent years. So I think that's a very, very positive sign for the ecosystem and for the fishing communities around, around Placentia Bay. And although a lot of it hasn't officially been quantified yet, and that work is still in progress, these are things that are indicating that the work that we've done is actually helping, which is very, very rewarding. I want to do it more and I want to do it at different places. Yeah, I hope people will be able to see the result of that and, and feel good about it as well, not only our team, but everybody.